So the, uh, pro the, the program for this had a title, uh, which is the same thing, but The Immigrant Worlds of Ybor City. And there's a, uh, a wonderful book by Gary Marmino. If you haven't met Gary, you'll meet him at the end of this, of this uh, your time here. But uh, Gary was my major professor at USF. He is really kind of the, the dean of, of, of um, immigrant history here at Tampa in Florida. Um, but I borrowed a title from a different book for the, 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 the actual title of my, my talk, and that's just to give a, a nod to somebody else, actually somebody who, who partnered with, with um, Gary to write a book in the 1980s, a man named Tony Pizzo. Uh, Tony was not a professional historian, but he had a true love of Ybor City, and uh, in his spare time, however he had spare time, uh, he documented and promoted the history of Ybor City beginning in the 1950s and 60s, literally through uh, his death in the mid-1990s. And so he wrote a book called uh, Tampa Town, uh, a cracker town with a Latin accent. And so that's why I took uh, the title of that for my talk, because it's a little nod to Tony and all of his work in preserving uh, and promoting the history of Ebor City. And uh, in both those book titles, Immigrant World of Ebor City and uh, a Cracker Town with a Latin accent, really do describe Tampa and Ebor City very well. And so uh, I'll give you all just a little background in, in Tampa, and then we'll get into, um, into Ebor. So, uh, so you all are in downtown Tampa. Uh, uh, Tampa started out in the 1820s uh, as a military fort called Fort Brooke, and a little town began growing to the north of that military fort. On this map right here, if we were to locate uh, where we are on that map, uh, that location would be in the water. Uh, downtown Tampa has grown physically a bit in the past 110, 112 years through dredging and, and port uh, improvements and things like that. So we're on the bottom right hand corner of the map, just off the shoreline in about three feet of water. And so hopefully it won't be in three feet of water again anytime soon. Uh, but, uh, but this plan of Tampa was done in the 1850s. Tampa didn't look a whole, much, whole lot different 30 years later at the beginning of the more city. Uh, if we were a city, we were the, the only city in South Florida uh, before the Civil War, other than Key West. Key West will play a role in probably a few weeks that you're here, we'll talk about Key West a little bit today. Um, but uh, other than Key West, which actually at, at, at various points in the 19th century was the largest city in Florida, uh, Tampa was the only city in what was called South Florida. The, uh, the city was first based on an economy centered around uh, supporting the fort, uh, but also fishing, uh, but in the 1850s, uh, cattle ranching became very popular. And the main destination for that cattle was Cuba, Havana. Uh, the, the cattle in Florida wasn't the best quality. Uh, it was uh, actually descendants of Spanish cattle that came here in the 1500s. And so uh, by, the, by the 1850s, the, uh, the cattle had a reputation for being kind of scrawny, but very, very hardy. Uh, to survive basically on its own in the scrub of Florida. And so these, uh, these cowmen would literally round up, find the cattle, they would drive it uh, in herds to Tampa, and then board ships and send it to Cuba. Because no matter how poor quality our cattle was, it was better than the lack of cattle they had in Cuba. So uh, having beef to augment the uh, proteins they did have in Cuba was really important. So Tampa served as that, as that um, launching point for a few years, and then it actually went a little further south to a place called Punta Rasa near Boca Grande. Um, and then from there, it, uh, it, it, it remained through the, uh, the mid 19th century. But we even have ties that go back to Cuba further than that. Uh, the west coast of Florida, when it was still, Florida was still a Spanish possession, uh, was home to a series of fishing ranchos, uh, seasonal fishing camps operated by Cuban fishermen. Uh, but sometimes employing the, the, the last few Native Americans that were on the Gulf Coast. And, uh, and they would, these Cuban fishermen and the Native people would, would fish for mullet and, and, and other uh, seafood. They would salt it here and they would take it back uh, to Cuba in the, uh, I guess, in the spring. Um, and it's interesting that they had to come all the way up here to do that. that. I think that's some indication of how the waters around Cuba were already being fished out by the late uh, 18th and early 19th century. Uh, to even provide a need to push the, the fisheries this far north. Um, so it's, uh, it, it shows again how, how long established Cuba had been, uh, but how kind of fresh things were still here in, uh, 
in Florida. And even kind of one more, go back kind of one more century to kind of one last connection between Cuba and Florida. In 1762, December 1762, at the, toward the end of what was the Seven Years' War, uh, the British Navy captured Havana. And uh, Spain really wanted Havana back. And the only way they could do it was to trade land. And so Spain possessed Florida. And at the time, Florida was not just the peninsula, but all the way uh, to some dispute, possibly all the way to the Mississippi River. And so the Spanish traded all of that territory for Havana. And that just shows how important Havana was to Spain's you know, New World economy, the, the, the Western economy, and how unimportant Florida was. Uh, and, and that, unfortunately, that, that lack of importance survived the 19th century. Uh, this is a, uh, a chart from the 1840s, I think they gave 1840. And this really is how people would have seen both Florida and Cuba. Uh, very little interior knowledge of Florida at this time, uh, but uh, people traveling would have been doing so by boat far more than traveling overland in Florida. So, after the Civil War, um, this, Florida's economy is a shambles, as you can imagine, both southern states are, are that way. Florida was, is a southern state. Um, but there was beginnings of an industry in Key West. Again, Key West, because of its location, had a lot of advantages in the mid-19th century. Uh, one of them was all the shipping that was going by uh, through the Gulf Stream. And so one of the first industries was the wrecking industry in Key West. Uh, literally, the salvaging of ships that he wrecked um, on the, the reefs in and around the, the Keys. And so some of these wreckers actually had bad reputations for moving channel markers or putting markers where they don't belong to actually cause these wrecks. Uh, but they, uh, they also, some reputable people who, who made quite a bit of money uh, actually salvaging these, these, these shipwrecks. But that's a seasonal business and also not a very consistent business. So they were looking for something new. So just a few years after the American Civil War, you have the first revolution in Cuba, the 1768 set to what would be the, the, the 1868 to what would be the 1878 Ten Years' War. And so that war actually benefited Florida, and particularly Key West, because it pushed the production of cigars uh, from Havana, not entirely, but it, it began that. that that leap across the Florida Straits into Key West. And you know, the reason for that is proximity. It's only 90 miles between Key West and Havana. And so it's very easy to get the people and to get the tobacco across the Florida Straits. And so Key West benefited greatly beginning in the late 1860s from that conflict that was going on in Cuba. So the, the war, as the name implies, lasted 10 years. Uh, but even though the war ended in 1878, the industry did not cease. They didn't leave Key West and everybody come back to Havana. And that is, uh, is, is in part because of how uh, tobacco and cigars were treated from a tariff standpoint by the federal government. You had uh, high tariffs on finished cigars, but not on the raw material tobacco. And so that actually kept the industry in Key West. Uh, but there still was a very, very thriving, and still is a very thriving, uh, cigar industry in Havana. And so there was a lot of back and forth between Key West and Cuba with, this, with the workers. And so that made for a very unstable workforce. You needed to have reliable workers to have a reliable product. And so that was still a problem. Another problem that Key West had is there was no continual source, a reliable or continual source of fresh water. Fresh water in Key West fell from the sky. And that was it until probably the Overseas Railroad in 1912. They were able to bring pipes along the railroad tracks. And so uh, there were some springs, but there's so much salt water intrusion, they weren't very reliable. So there are a lot of cisterns in Key West uh, to capture and hold that rainwater. So there was a limitation to how many people the island would uh, could, could um, sustain and support. So by the early 1880s, the cigar manufacturers, who still had a foot in Key West and a foot in Havana, began looking elsewhere for a place for um, cigar manufacturing. So they looked everywhere, and they actually put factories almost everywhere. There were a lot of factories up north, um, New York, Chicago, Pennsylvania. Um, there, were, there were factories up there, but they had a hard time operating in the wintertime because it was very cold and dry, and that's condition, those conditions are not good for tobacco. You need moisture, and you need humidity, and you need a little bit of heat 
to keep that tobacco pliable. Of course, you can condition the air, but as you heat the building, that dries it out even more. So you have to add humidity. So it was a difficult proposition. Not to say they didn't have factors in there. They absolutely did. Um, and there was a very large population of Cubans in New York, and so that sus could sustain the factories. But they needed, the manufacturers needed um, locations for their factories in a warmer climate. And so they really looked no further than the Gulf Coasts. But they didn't just look due north of Florida. They looked all around, from Galveston, Mobile, and then kind of Cedar Key, and then down here to Tampa. And so in 1885, there uh, were a couple cigar manufacturers who came to Tampa. And they came here because they heard about this little town that had just received the railroad. And so the thing that Tampa didn't have, and it's a Key West, another problem with Key West was the lack of transportation. Everything was done by ship. There was no railroad to Key West, or no road to Key West until 1912, when Flatter brought the railroad down. So transportation was difficult, shipping the finished cigars out. So they needed a place where you could reliably bring tobacco in, bring workers in, uh, but not too close to Havana so they could leave easily, but also have a method of shipping the finished product out to the Northeast and Midwest markets. And so in 1884, Tampa finally got a railroad. Henry Plant brought the railroad to Tampa. He's the guy who built the Tampa Hotel, which is now University of Tampa. So with, with Plant's railroad and steamships, Tampa was a place of reliable transportation. So this was uh, the guy named Gavino, Gut Gavino Gutierrez came through here. He was friends of uh, Vicente Martinez Ebor and Ignacio Aya. And he said to, to them, when he saw them in the US, you guys gotta go to Tampa and see this town. So they did, they came here. This is the Tampa that they saw. This is downtown Tampa, circa 1885. Uh, nothing but sandy streets, one and two story buildings, um, a town that was still, though the railroad had come, still crippled by a civil war that had ended 20 years earlier. Um, just to give you an indication of Tampa, on the, on the eve of, of the cigar industry, in 1880, the census of 1880 counted 720 people in the town of Tampa. Things had gotten so bad that after the Civil War, a man named John T. Leslie in 1869 ran for mayor of Tampa. Uh, his only campaign promise that is if he was elected, he would abolish the city. And he was elected. And he did. He got rid of the city. Uh, there were a variety of reasons for that. Uh, the taxes that were starting to come due and those kind of things were, were difficult. So they thought, we're not going to be a city, so we have no taxes. But also, the state legislature, which uh, was a uh, Republican controlled legislature at the time, had passed a, uh, a bill about how towns and cities could reorganize following the war of uh, preparation to be readmitted to the Union, and that disenfranchised uh, former Confederates and enfranchised um, African Americans. Now, you know, people who just arrived, so Republicans. And so, John T. Leslie was one of those former Confederates. And so, they thought, well, rather than reorganize, we'll just cease to exist. And that's what happened. And Leslie's name is going to come back in the story in a little while. So, so that's kind of the situation. Eight to 720 people in the town of Tampa uh, in 1880. Uh, Hillsborough County, which at that time was the county that we're in right now, plus Pinellas County, the county to the west that has St. Pete, Clearwater, and the beaches, there were 2,500 people. There are high schools in now Hillsborough County that have 2,500 people in it. And so it was a very, very lowly populous place, but a lot of territory. So that's the situation that, that Ebor and Ignacio Aya find themselves in when they arrive in Tampa in 1885. So they meet with the newly formed Board of Trade, and they talk about what they want. They want land, but they also want some help. They want help from the, uh, the, 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 um, the leadership of Tampa kind of the cracker leadership, as it were. Because by the 1880s, carpetbackers had pretty much gone back, and now Tampa was, was back in hands of those former Confederates. They said, we'll bring our cigar factories here, and we'll even buy land. We're not asking for free land, necessarily. But what we need help is uh, when we have labor problems, because we have, the, our, our, our workers can get a little rambunctious sometimes. Uh, they, they may want to advocate for higher wages or for shorter working hours or whatever it may be. And so they go on strike at times. So if those strikes last too long, or if there's agitators who are coming in, we need your help getting rid of those people. And the people of Tampa, the Board of Trade, were, said, fine, we'll do whatever you want. We'll handle your labor problems. Um, you just bring your industry here. And so Ignacio Aya bought, I think, 20 acres of land. 
Uh, but Ebor actually wanted more. He, so he wanted to buy 40 acres of land. So he found this guy, John T. Leslie, the guy who was mayor for a minute and a half. Um, and uh, he heard that Leslie had 40 acres outside of the town limits. Ebor didn't want his factory town in Tampa. He wanted it next to Tampa because he wanted that control. It's almost like the, the idea of the Pullman town. And so Leslie was happy to sell him that land, but it was going to cost $9,000. $9,000 for 40 acres is a pretty good price. But Leslie had just bought that land for $5,000 a few months before, and Ebor knew that. So Ebor stormed out of me. He said, I'm not going to be you know, ripped off by you, dumb cracker. And so he stormed down the street. A man named John Henderson chased after him and said, look, if you give him the $9,000, we'll give you a $4,000 rebate. So you pay the five that you want to pay, he gets the nine that he wants, and we got our cigar factories. And so Ebor said, fine, we'll do that. And so the deal was done, and Ebor bought his land, I bought his land, and we have Ebor City. And so these are the players. Um, none of them crackers, so the, the cracker accent comes from people like Leslie. Um, Ebor and I are both Spaniards, and uh, Henry Plant was a Connecticut Yankee, um, though he spent most of his time, particularly during and after the Civil War in the South. Uh, but these are really the, the founding fathers of modern Tampa. So even though Tampa is an old city by Florida standards in the 1830s, uh, modern Tampa, the Tampa you see today, really has its birth in the 1880s when, when these guys were bringing their capital and their influence to the city. Interestingly, of these three, the, the only one who really decided to be a full-time resident was Ebor. I had a home here, but he went back and forth quite a bit between Havana and Key West plant. Um, never moved here, and when he was here, he didn't even stay in his own hotel. He stayed in his private rail car, and so uh, so he came here quite a bit. But Ebor was the only one who actually made his home in, in Tampa or in Ebor City. So this is uh, these are the first tracks that um, Henry Plant brought in. Uh, they come down Polk Street. Those same tracks that are there today, if you find yourself on Polk Street, same tr same route that uh, was brought here in 1884. Eventually. Uh, I think five years later, they uh, crossed the river and went down the Great Peninsula to Port Tampa, which was our first port. And then a few years after that, a uh, plant built Tampa Bay Hotel. And so you can see it was incredibly important for plant to, to bring that rail line here. And this, this map illustrates that. The red lines indicate Henry Plant's rail system. And this is uh, in the late 1890s, so he'd already pushed it further south into the interior. Uh, the kind of the railroad story of Florida is the story of two Henrys, Henry Plant, who was Central and West Florida, and Henry Flagler, who was East Florida, all the way down eventually to Key West in 1912. And, uh, and the railroad guys are great because their maps always reflect only their stuff. And so you see Plant's railroads here in red. If you look closely, you see a little thin black line going down the East Coast, and that's Flagler. Uh, but Plant didn't want to show anybody too much that Flagler had railroads because he wanted everybody on Plant. But also this map shows those steamship lines. So not only did you have a method, again, to, to ship stuff out, but you also could bring things in by boat and send things out by boat. And also people. The, the, the idea of, of, the, of the passenger traffic, while there always had been passenger uh, ships coming in out of Tampa, uh, plant ships really, really um, solidified that and made Tampa a, a port of call as well as a port of embarkation and debarkation. Uh, Plant also established a bunch of these hotels around the state at the ends of his rail lines, um, including the Tampa Bay Hotel, again, which is now the University of Tampa. So, so Ebor went to work pretty quickly when he bought his land. He uh, had Gabino Gutierrez, the man who introduced him to Ebor City, or Tampa, excuse me, uh, was also a civil engineer. And so he did some of the work of, of laying out what would become Ebor City. Now, uh, the, um, the line that kind of curves here and then goes along this way is the railroad line. This is Henry Plant's railroad. So his railroad literally goes through Ebor City, no accident. But Ebor really wanted that and really needed that. Um, and then came further south here and put it the Tampa. I'll show you how the two, the two places connect. And so the, um, the idea was that, again, that Ebor would create this company town and start it really from scratch. But he had a little bit of help, again, from Leslie, because Leslie already had a plat of part of what would become Ebor City. And so this is, um, this is John T. Leslie's plat 
of, uh, of what they called East Tampa at that time, outside of the town limits. And you see, um, while this certainly wasn't platted, it probably wasn't you know, even run out too much. And the biggest features are these orange groves. Uh, orange groves really dominated the, the landscape of, of Tampa in the 1880s. Between that and, uh, and scrub land for cattle to graze, that's what you saw of, really a lot of. But you had this head start that Leslie provided to e -board. You can see also kind of why he wanted to charge a little bit more, because he actually had uh, gone through trouble to have part of the property plat. So that plat is this section of what is now Ebor City. Uh, what isn't shown here, uh, particularly at least you know, very well, is south of this is 6th, 5th, 4th, 3rd. So kind of south of 3rd Avenue here, so going 3rd Avenue south, was very marshy. And so Ebor actually had to bring in a lot of sand in kind of dredging some areas to even make this buildable. So it appears buildable here only because they were able to fill this in. Um, this uh, Ebor City and West Ham, which we'll talk about in a little while, were both uh, called kind of alligator pits for quite a while because there are lots of alligators uh, in the area because this was very, very swampy uh, going here and then going further to the west into uh, actually this part of Tampa, uh, the downtown Tampa. This was uh, called the estuary because there was literally an estuary all along here, going to the northeast toward Ebor City. So in 1886 is when you have this plat. It's also when Ebor decides to, or Ebor and Aya both decide they want to open their factories. This is uh, VM Ebor's first factory, made out of wood. And it was a very s small, relatively speaking, uh, factory building. He still maintained the factory in Key West. He still wasn't quite sure if this experiment in this little town called Tampa was going to work out. Um, and that was until a fire devastated a huge portion of Key West, including Ebor's factory. And so he, he went ahead and decided, I'm going to leave Key West for good, and I'm going to put all my resources in my new town of Ebor City in Tampa. So while he built this factory and opened this factory, he started work on a large brick factory, which I think you guys are going to certainly walk by uh, during your walking tour, whenever that turns out, I think there's some dispute about when it's going to be because of the rain. Uh, kind of one of those Florida afternoon thunderstorms you're going to be able to see uh, for yourself. So that was Ebor's factory. This is Aya's factory. They both built wood factories to begin with. And they, they planned on opening at the same time. It was April, I want to say April 15th, but I can't quite remember. But sometime in April in 1886, they wanted to open the exact same day. Um, but as luck and just irony would have it, Ebor, uh, when he wanted to open that day, his workers went on strike for the day. And he should have known better. And so if he was here right now, I tell him, you should have known better. So this is the 1880s. So we're still a few years away from the second Cuban Revolution. But there still is an incredible amount of animosity between Cubans and Spaniards. And for whatever reason, and there's maybe written as to why he decided this, but it doesn't make sense to me in the least. For whatever reason, he hired a Spanish foreman for his factory. And his Cuban workers refused to work for that Spanish foreman. Now, I am smart. He hired a Cuban foreman, apparently. And so his factory opened on time. And, uh, and he didn't wait for Mr. Cuban. He just said, you, 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 you're the dummy for doing that. I'm going to move forward. And so uh, Ebor's factory opened a day or so later. So even though it's Ebor City, uh, and I had owned half the property that uh, Ebor owned, his factory from that point on became factory number one. And in advertisements, cigar labels, things like that, he proudly advertised factory number one um, as a little jab to Mr. Ebor. Um, now, I have no idea why, but Ebor's factory is number six. Um, and so the factory numbers, it's all about licensing with the state. Um, and I've not seen a complete list from the state of the factories, particularly two through five. Um, but there, there actually was a guy named Emilio Pons who was friends with Ebor and I. And he also opened a factory around the same time. Um, and so I, I don't quite understand why Ebor is number six. Um, but that's one of those funny works of history. But he's factory number six. But this is factory number one, the uh, Sanchez and I factory. So, but as I mentioned, Ebor was hard at work not only operating his, um, his wooden factory, but building this, the VM Ebor Company um, factory. And uh, they opened this 
And uh, I think a year later, 1887, and it was uh, not the first brick building. It's sometimes called the first brick building in, in the area, but it was the second or third brick building in the, uh, in the what became Tampa. Uh, but it was a really a monument to Ebor's efforts in his, his establishment of a business here in Tampa. The factory complex, again, which you guys are going to walk by, is enormous. And the factory itself, which was the first building that was built, is quite large on its own. But over time, he built in a sense, another factory to serve entirely as a stemmery, a place where the, the two halves of the, of the tobacco leaf are pulled from the stem. Um, there's a, if you talk, there's few old timers left from this generation, uh, but I'm sure James probably heard this from his own family. Uh, the funniest thing is talking to some of these old timers and they'll, they'll tell you that their mother was a stripper in Tampa. Uh, but they're, because that's what they call the prickle to the stem. <laughs> Um, and it was really women and children who did that work because of the delicacy of the, of the, of the, of the craft. Um, having um, kind of indelicate hands, uh, man hands as it were, it would be too difficult to, to, to properly take the stem out and have the two uh, halves of the tobacco leaf. So there was a whole stemmery building um, attached to this in a, in a bonded warehouse and all kinds of things. So it was basically a whole block eventually. Uh, I also opened up his own brick factory a few blocks to the north. And um, and it was not it was the factory building itself was as large as, as he was, but he didn't have as many of the ancillary buildings. Again, while he was very, very wealthy and did very well here, he didn't have quite the same presence. Though he did found, which I'll we'll talk about in a little while, the Centro Espanol, one of the uh, social and mutual aid societies here in New York City, actually funded its um, funded its, its construction and also funded uh, some other things. Um, he just. So it was always kind of the, the second fiddle to, uh, to Mr. Ebor. And I say Mr. Ebor, his name really was Martinez. Um, it's, it should be Carl Martinez City uh, because his father was Martinez, but as you all know, and the, the Latin naming, Martinez E. Ebor, his mother was Ebor. Um, but people in Tampa had no idea. They saw the last name Ebor, you're Ebor. And he just went with that. He also spelled it with an I for most of his life. Uh, and so it was later, I think in Key West, when he changed the I to a Y. So, uh, whatever animosity may have existed between Mr. Leslie and Mr. Ebor uh, went away because of business. Uh, one of the things they partnered in was this uh, streetcar system. The first streetcar system in Tampa, connecting Tampa, the town of Tampa, and, uh, and Ebor City. It was at first a steam-powered streetcar, um, but eventually in the 1890s they electrified the system. So in 1887, uh, the city leaders or the town leaders decided they needed to reincorporate the city of Tampa because again, remember, Leslie disincorporated the city in 1869. And so they reincorporated the city of Tampa, actually the anniversary was just a couple days ago, July 15th, uh, 1887. But it wasn't the same little town uh, limits that you saw on that, that first map. It actually had four different wards or sections. Downtown Tampa became the first ward, a new suburb, uh, mostly a uh, Anglo suburb called Tampa Heights was Ward Number Two. Another Anglo suburb to the, uh, the west side of the river was Hyde Park, is Ward Three. But then Ebor City was Ward Four. Ebor City was never a separate incorporated city, though it was run as such by Ebor. Um, but there was city police protection beginning in 1887, and um, and there was a lot of just conflict between the city police and the, the county sheriffs. Um, over time in both Tampa and Ebor City. Uh, basically, whoever was kind of in charge of the factions that were going on uh, had one of the other police force at their disposal. So you had city faction and county faction that used the police and the sheriff's department as troopers, in a sense, against each other. And that actually played out, you'll hear about this probably later in, in your time here, uh, in the 18, 1935 election for the city of Tampa's mayor. They actually had to call up the National Guard because things got so violent. So, and the last thing about Plant, this is the Tampa Bay Hotel, now the University of Tampa. Um, Plant, uh, like I said, never really moved to Tampa, though he visited here quite often. Uh, the hotel was his second hotel here in Tampa. He actually built a small hotel called Port Tampa Inn in Port Tampa, which is about uh, nine miles to the southwest of here by McDill Air Force Base. If you look at a map of, of Tampa, you see McDill basically takes up the southern part of the peninsula. Just to the west of that is Port Tampa City. Uh, and that's what Henry Plant developed. That's where his steamships came in and out of. Although there was a small harbor here um, before the, the Port of Tampa was created in 1906, 
um, most of the tobacco and most of the Cuban workforce that was coming into Tampa came into Port Tampa and then up that rail line uh, that plan established and into Tampa and into Ypor City. This is Tampa in 1892. And so this is basically the extent of, 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 of you know, the population. So we are right now um, right about there, still in the water. And this is the area that was Fort Brook. This is downtown Tampa. And so the four wards are downtown Ward 1, uh, Tampa Heights Ward 2, Hyde Park Ward 3, and then here is Ybor City. So you see the proximity between Ybor City and Tampa. Again, this is very purposeful. Uh, Ybor wanted his town, basically, to be close enough to a town or city to get the advantages that he needed, but far enough away that he could control what was going on. And part of that control was both kind of financial, he had financial in mind, but also um, somewhat helpful in mind. Uh, he sold not just um, kind of apartments or, 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 um, or spaces and boarding houses to his workers, but he actually built and sold homes to his workforce. He wanted that stability. Again, he, the reason, one of the main reasons for coming to Tampa was a stability in the workforce. And so he built very inexpensive, um, not luxurious, but uh, little houses, those casitas, um, or shotgun houses. And he sold those to his workforce at a reasonable rate. Again, he wasn't you know, using company script, he wasn't trying to rake his workers over the coals for money. It, there, there was, of course, a benefit to him, because he had the stable workforce, but he realized if you could make homeowners out of his workers, then they would be less likely to leave. They actually have a reason to stay. If they're just sitting or just living in a boarding house and they have everything they need in you know, a little suitcase or a bag, then they can leave overnight. And they often did uh, because of a variety of reasons, but you know, usually pay being the main one. But if you're anchored here because you own a home, then you're less likely to do so. So he really uh, pushed for home ownership and he constructed quite a few homes. He made some money in that. There's, again, he's, he's not just doing this for the, the benefit of his workforce. He's benefits him, but it, in, in, in the end, it does benefit them as well. So this is one of the kind of key images in Tampa history. Uh, it shows Jose Marti, who I mean, down here, it is right there, the man himself, on the steps of the BME War factory in Tampa in the early 1890s. Uh, and you'll hear this a zillion times during your time here. But uh, Marti came to Tampa, particularly to Ybor City, over 20 times between 1892 and 1894, uh, raising money, raising uh, support for what will become Cuba's uh, revolution of 1895. And so he was well, obviously the key guy, uh, but not the only guy involved in the revolutionary effort, but he was by far the most famous. And so whenever he was in town, it attracted huge crowds. He actually spoke on the lector stand in the Ebor factory, despite the fact that Ebor was a Spaniard, despite the fact that he made the mistake and hired the Spaniards to form in 1886, he had lived in Cuba most of his life, most of his adult life. And so he really understood the, um, the plight of Cubans and supported the Cuban Revolution. He even turned over that first wood factory um, that he built to one of the Cuban, Cuban revolutionary patriotic groups, Alicio Cubano, and became one really of the first Cuban club. And so he was in full support of what was going on uh, with the revolutionary effort here in Tampa. So he was happy to have Marti uh, come to his factory and speak. Now, I've only heard this as a, as a legend, and I actually have only been in Cuba once, and I didn't see it when I was there, but it doesn't mean it's not true, steps. So do you know this to be true or not? That the, this, this, this talk in, in Tampa and, and, and Marti and the Ebor factory was so important that they ripped the steps off of the front of this building and sent them down to Havana at some point. I haven't been able to find any reference to this. But I've heard it a zillion times. So, uh, so there you go. Uh, and so it's something I always say, I love it's true, but I've heard this, I didn't even know the first time I heard it, but I've heard it my entire life probably. James, I don't know if you grew up hearing that story too. Yeah, no, no, I didn't. But, um, but it's one of those things, the steps are different. If you look at this picture, um, the steps that are there today are different than these steps. Um, and so the designs, and these are iron steps. Um, this seems like it'd be very obvious where they are in Ebor, actually in, in, in Havana. Um, but I don't know, maybe they melted down at some point, maybe castrated. Um, but, um, but I heard that story, that 
that it's a representation of Tampa as the cradle of Cuban liberty uh, and, and the importance of Tampa in the 1890s revolution. But they actually broke these steps out and put them somewhere in the van. And true or not, it's a fun story. So when Marti was here, uh, there was actually an attempt on his life. Uh, they, they, there was uh, somebody poisoned uh, a drink that, that he had, and um, obviously, unfortunately enough, it did not kill him. But it made him certainly a little more aware of the dangers surrounding him. And, and also, people in Tampa became very, very aware of those dangers. And so, from that point on, when he stayed in Tampa, he stayed almost exclusively in this home. This is the home of, uh, of two Afro-Cubans, uh, Puerto and Paulina Pedroso. And the Pedrosos were, were a great symbol, or are a great symbol of, uh, and often um, under talked about, underappreciated segment of Ybor's population, which is the Afro-Cuban section of, of, of Tampa and Ybor City, and, and that Afro-Cuban population. A very important uh, component, of course, to the revolution were Afro-Cubans. Um, and Marti understood this, and so he purposefully would walk arm-in-arm arm with Paulina when he was in Tampa down 7th Avenue. 7th Avenue was kind of the main drag of, of um, Ybor City, to show the, the, the interconnectedness of white Cubans and black Cubans coming together against a common enemy. And that common enemy, of course, is Spain. And so he stayed at this house with, um, with Paulina and her husband, Roberto. Uh, reportedly, Roberto would stand or, or would kind of sit in a chair in front of the door with a shotgun, making sure no one came in. Um, the Pedrosos, uh, unlike most um, people of African descent in Tampa, um, were, were major property owners. They not only owned this boarding house on uh, 8th and 13th, uh, they also owned several lots along 8th Avenue, and so they uh, were pretty well-to-do people. Um, if, if they had been kind of combined with the African-American population in Tampa, they would have certainly been among the wealthiest um, African-Americans, or they're Afro-Cubans, in Tampa. Um, so it wasn't, it was really no, 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 um, no coincidence that Marti would seek them out um, for their support, but also the symbolism behind the Afro-Cuban and, uh, and, and, and white Cuban uh, people coming together in Spain. So again, wanted to show the proximity between uh, Tampa and Ybor City. Just pulled this uh, key page from the uh, Sanborn map of Tampa. This is from 1899, but this would the same picture would apply uh, very directly in 1895. So again, you have uh, downtown right here. This was originally Fort Brook. And you have Ybor City, and you've got the plant rail line connecting those two, but you also have a streetcar system connecting these two. Um, but you also, on this map, have something new. And this is this area right here called West Tampa. West Tampa was a separate city from Tampa, and separate from, from Ybor City. Uh, founded in 1895, or I should say incorporated in 1895, founded a few years earlier. And it survived as a separate city until 1925, and founded solely for the cigar industry. And though most of the population uh, were Cubans, and were some Spaniards, it was actually founded by a Scotsman, a guy named Human Farmer. Um, he was uh, the city attorney for the city of Tampa. He was a major property owner of land on the west side of the river. And he saw what was going on in Ybor City, and he thought, well, I got land, I can do the same thing. And so he actually would give away land to cigar factory owners and as an inducement to bring them here. And then he would sell the land around them um, for businesses and, and homes and things like that. So West Tampa uh, became a very important um, spot in Tampa and in the story of Cubans, particularly Cubans, in, uh, in Tampa. While Ybor City, and I, this is a generalization that of course is wrong, but Ybor City was very much a Latin melting pot, um, or eventually melting pot but at some point. Was first, it was very polarized, but you had Spaniards, you had Cubans, and you had Italians. We'll talk about Italians in a little while. And while you had that same mix in West Tampa, this is a picture of West Tampa, by far the majority of people in West Tampa were Cubans. And so it was really a, more, more so a Cuban enclave than Ymore City, although there was lots and lots of Cubans in Ymore City as well. Um, so this is a very early photograph of uh, West Tampa. This building here was called Cespedes Hall. A uh, name for Carlos Espedes, the man who um, started, in effect, the Ten Years' War in 1868. Um, so he was uh, he died during the war in 1874. But uh, when they built they built a gathering hall for the 
the population, they wanted to name it after somebody who was very important in Cuban history. And so Carlos Espedes uh, was the man for whom it was named. Uh, people who became important later in Cuba's revolution and Cuba's government, including, including Tomas Estrada Palma, came to Cespedes Hall, came to Tampa uh, to speak. Um, and so it was really a great gathering point for, uh, for the Cubans of West Tampa beer. They sold one brand of beer, and that was the, the beer that was sent to them by the brewery. And so you had lots and lots of saloons in Tampa, um, owned by this German guy named um, Robert Muggy, that uh, sold Budweiser because he had the Budweiser distributorship. Um, but it was sometimes unreliable, and sometimes it wasn't that good because it took a little while to get here from St. Louis. And so Ebor and Monroe saw a need uh, to have home brewed beer, home brewed beer, but locally brewed beer. And so they opened up this large brewery, not only to supply Tampa, but again, this is 1896, 1897, they had an eye towards Cuba. So this is during the Cuban Revolution, but they know. They kind of see the writing on the wall. The revolution is not only doing well, but American involvement may not be too far behind. And once the revolution's over, they'll have a whole market to themselves, Cuba and Havana in particular, because of all the connections that Ebor already has. And so they're laying the groundwork for that by opening up this brewery. Um, of course, they don't know how many years before the war ends, but just a few years before the war ends. Um, and so it became the biggest moneymaker for Ebor, more so than his um, cigar factory. And so when Ebor died in his 1901, um, you, his assets could not be liquidated. He, had, he was by far the wealthiest man in Tampa, and there wasn't enough money in Tampa to liquidate. Uh, but when you looked at kind of the balance sheet, his, his estate, uh, the, uh, the brewery was the most, was the most valuable single asset that, uh, that Ebor had. So some shots of what Ebor looked like in the beginning. Um, there's lots of stories about Tampa and Ebor in particular um, that involve sand. Sand was everywhere. We're in Florida, and there is uh, beaches everywhere, but this is beach sand. And I can attest, I've actually been underneath the Ebor factory, and it is the purest white sand that you'll see. It's like a beach. Literally, it's like a beach. And that's what it looked like. That's what you can see here. Um, it wasn't until the turn of the 20th century that it began to pave the roads. And so it was a, a very kind of dusty, dirty space. Um, even though Ebor had the idea of home ownership and wanted to build these casitas, uh, the vast majority of the earliest immigrants to Ebor City and to West Tampa were single men. And so while there were women who worked in the industry, there were women that came here, single men, or even men with families who left their families behind, uh, came here. And so you had a lot of boarding houses. And that was really the majority of, of the houses that were built, or the structures that were built originally were boarding houses. Uh, but again, Ebor wanted that stability of families being here, and so he wanted to make sure that that, that was a possibility. And so that's when the, the housing, the single family housing stock began to grow. Uh, Aya also built homes, and so again, I've only been to Cuba once, um, and I didn't get a chance to see these, but apparently these homes here, they're concrete. They are, there's a set of homes in Havana that are identical to these, and whether Aya built the ones in Havana first, then built them here, or built them here first, and then built them there. I don't know the order of things, but there, there's a twin set of, of homes that still exist today, as far as I know, in Havana. They, I know they were there as of, I think, five years ago. Um, and so that's, that's them. So there are very few concrete homes. Uh, almost everything's made out of wood, because that's the easiest building material. And so most of the casitas, most of the early cigar factories, the businesses, they're all made out of wood. And that's what you see here. But there were some of these. And that, of course, is a more stable form of construction because of termites, but also because of fire. A fire, uh, like in every other 19th century uh, city and town in the U.S. and the world, uh, particularly in the U.S., though, the, 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 the up and coming cities, uh, that had so much of that the building stock made out of wood, fire was a major problem. And so there were major fires in both West Tampa and Ybor City uh, up through the early 1900s, uh, basically clearing out that old wood. Um, commercial housing, or commercial building stock, replacing it with brick, though the housing stock remained almost exclusively made of wood. Uh, this is West Tampa, but again, the, the two are so similar, West Tampa and Ybor City. Um, I don't, if you guys have a chance to go to West Tampa during your time here, you really should. I don't think any formal tour of West Tampa that's um, being anticipated. But Ybor City is, the, the place that gets the most attention. And it's been that way since the 1930s, really. Um, 
As the cigar industry began to decline, this again it depends on what Gary is going to say at the end of your, your time here. Um, but as the, as the cigar industry began to decline, uh, the city of Tampa, the leaders of Ebor City, began to try and find a new way for Ebor to survive. And so it became, even in the 30s, looked at as both an industri industrial place but also as a tourist destination. And so um, that really solidified in the 70s and the 80s and became kind of a new version of Ebor City. West Tampa never experienced that. West Tampa is still, not, not to be critical of too much of Ebor City, but West Tampa is, is more authentic to its original style and look and roots than Ebor City. So not, not, not that you're going to see a Disneyland version of Ebor City, um, but if you really want to kind of see what they looked like for tourism and all that stuff, West Tampa is, is, a, is a place I suggest you go, um, because it really is a really neat part of town. So I mentioned, of course, the uh, Cuban Revolution. In uh, 1895, another story that may or may not be true, uh, but it's a fun story, so I'll tell this one. Um, Marti is in New York, decides the revolution is going to start February 25th, I think, of 1895. And so he writes the note, when this is going to happen, uh, sends it to Tampa, actually West Tampa. The O'Halloran Cigar Factory in West Tampa, it's uh, ruled as a cigar. Uh, that cigar is given with two other cigars to a courier, goes to Cuba, goes through customs, lights the cigar with a note in it, um, gives the customs guy another cigar, uh, puts out the cigar when he leaves customs, and then finds a general, starts the war. Now I understand that this, the actual note to start the war is apparently quite big. Never fit in a cigar. Um, and so it's a great story, but it probably isn't. Um, but it's another one of those things where, where people have, I think rightly, but wrongly by, by line, uh, made those connections between, uh, between the Cuban Revolution and Cuba's independence and Tampa, and West Tampa. Because again, West Tampa kind of gets forgotten to a Halloran Cigar Factory, if that actually happened, which it probably didn't, is not in Tampa, it's actually in West Tampa. Um, and it's these Irish guys, uh, Halloran, who actually Spanish, but uh, through Irish descent. Um, but uh, but again, regardless of how it got there, Tambo or no, uh, the revolution starts February '95. Marti uh, wanting to to actually see the revolution through, uh, uh, it, it kind of joins the fight. Unfortunately, dies um, early on. The, uh, the fight lasts three years. The U.S. government gets involved and makes a bigger war out of it, literally and figuratively. Um, we have what we've called the Spanish-American War, also some other names to it. Um, Tampa, because of a variety of, of factors, becomes a point, uh, the port of embarkation for U.S. troops going to Cuba to fight Spain, um, ostensibly for the, for the freedom of Cubans. And so um, Jacksonville is a port of embarkation for, uh, for the, the soldiers going to Puerto Rico and, of course, the West Coast from the Philippines and Guam. But Tampa, is that point of embarkation uh, for the soldiers going to Cuba. So that's what we have pictured here. Um, in Tampa, we make it kind of a big deal about this, particularly the Rough Riders and Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, there's actually a social group called the Rough Riders that are around today, part of our uh, big Gasparilla uh, parade and celebration we have in, in the wintertime here. Um, and so this is a picture of Teddy here with a, um, a colonel from the British military. Uh, this, uh, we also had here the Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, that were in the regular army, where Roosevelt was a volunteer who had to kind of control his way onto the ships and get to the fighting in Cuba. The Buffalo soldiers were always going to go because they were part of the regular army. They were, of course, the military, uh, the, the segregated part of the military fighting the Indian Wars out west after the Civil War. But all four uh, regiments of Buffalo soldiers came through Tampa. Uh, three of them were camped here, one was camped in Lakeland, uh, but passed through here to go to Cuba for the war. And this is just the mass of humanity that was down at Port Tampa during the, uh, the, the send out for soldiers in the war. And so there were around 30,000 soldiers who uh, were in Tampa in the summer of 1898. The population of Tampa at the time was 15,000 people. And so twice the population uh, was here uh, from around April to May to uh, September of 1898. Caused all kinds of problems, all kinds of stories about um, about the various red light districts in Tampa, including where we are right now, the District Center. Um, but uh, this area that was that was formerly 
the military fort called Fort Brook became the town of Fort Brook. Um, our friend John T. Leslie was the mayor of that town for a little while. Um, it was a town-wide red light district. It's where all the bars and brothels were. The soldiers found their way here um, on a regular basis. Uh, Ybor City also had its own um, own selection of saloons and, uh, and brothels, and so the uh, good people of Tampa were kind of shocked by all the behavior of the, uh, the soldiers, but of course they were frequenting these places before the soldiers got there. Uh, and I mentioned Robert Buggy, he became a millionaire because of this, because he owned the Budweiser ship trip. He actually opened a bar in Port Tampa called the Last Chance Saloon. Um, he had the, the whole bar for, I think it would see 500 people, was built in a matter of 48 hours. Um, and that's just you know, how quickly he wanted it up, but also just the amount of money that was involved. Um, Tampa was, um, there, there are people who will say that, uh, that Tampa really kind of got its, a, a big spark from the uh, soldiers and all the, the activity that was here during the Spanish-American War. Really likely not the case. Individuals like Buggy and I'm sure Ebor, who made lots and lots of money during that summer, Henry Plant did as well because the Army was using his rail lines, his steamships, his hotel, his buildings, and so he made a lot of money. Um, but the city itself was just kind of torn up by all these soldiers that were here. Um, the only lasting benefit was it was such a just a catastrophe getting all these people down the single rail line all the way to this little port that was nine miles away from, this, from the main city that it was finally the ammunition that the people of Tampa needed to have um, dredging and port um, improvements made to Tampa proper. And so that would still take another eight years to happen. But they pointed to the problems of the Spanish-American War um, to, uh, to, to uh, further their case of channel dredging and, and port improvements. So most people think, uh, when they think of the cigar factories, they were sick of these big, immense brick buildings. And that's what are still around today. Um, but so many of the factories Early on and all the way up through kind of the history of the cigar industry, were these little houses. Basically, they were either were, were formerly houses, they were still houses, um, so that a family would, would live in part, use the other part um, as, a, as a factory, so to speak. And they were called buckeyes or chichalis or bedbugs. And so there were so many of them around that they said there's, there's numerous bedbugs in uh, in Ybor City and in Tampa. And so this would, was really more of your typical factory. Uh, than the grand brick factories. Now, there were dozens of these grand brick factories, uh, the largest of which was in West Tampa, the Santa Ea Cigar Factory, which still stands today. And it, at uh, one time, employed as many as, a, as many as a thousand people in that one building. But though that had the majority of the income, you had these little mom and pop, for lack of a better term, factories that were really the lifeblood of the industry. So sometimes you would have somebody who owns a little factory like this working in a big factory, but also you have them kind of um, eking out their own living uh, with these little factories themselves. And so you also had uh, the, uh, an apprentice system, and so you had these factory schools. Uh, child labor was a, a major part of the, uh, the economy in Tampa, not just in the cigar industry, but in other industries as well. Um, Lewis Hine. Uh, who documented child labor across the country came to Tampa in 1909. So these pictures are from a little bit after the beginnings of the industry, but they show what life would have been like 10 years, 12 years before. Um, and so there were lots and lots of children who worked in, in all kinds of industries, but particularly the cigar industry. They mentioned the, uh, the stemming of the cigars was a, a, a delicate task that, um, that children could do, but they also, beginning at the age of 11 or 12, started the apprentice system for actually rolling cigars. And so both uh, men and women, uh, boys and girls, participated in the rolling of cigars. Um, there are also lots of other businesses that were associated, uh, the Bank of Ebor City, which is now um, a really neat uh, restaurant called Bernini um, on 7th Avenue, uh, was founded in 1905. Um, Ebor himself was really um, the, the first Latin to, uh, to become integrated into white Anglo society in Tampa. He actually was on the board of directors of, um, of one of the Anglo banks, Citizens Bank. And he really kind of entrenched himself in both Ebor society, he lived in Ebor city, but also in kind of the Anglo society of Tampa. Uh, the Spaniards, um, again, generalization that is 
mostly true, but you know, not, not to paint too too broad a picture. Spaniards in general were factory owners, managers, uh, foremen, kind of the, the, the mid to the high management, where you had Cubans as the main workforce. Those Spaniards were actually able, if they stayed here long enough, to become ingrained and, and entrenched in Anglo society, even moving out of Ybor City and moving into places like Hyde Park or Tampa Heights or later a place called Davis Island, which is just across the uh, channel from where we are right now. And so that became a place of, of, of privilege that they could move into. But actually, in the 1930s, during the WPA, there were interviews of uh, people of Ybor City, and, um, and Stetson Kennedy, one of the main interviewers, actually went on a tour of, of Ybor City and Tampa with this Cuban couple, and they actually drove by Davis Island, and they said that's where the first people lived. Um, so it was a place of aspiration for the Spaniards. Cubans at that time didn't, didn't think they could attain that. Italians as well, um, they would, would try and, 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 uh, and move up in Anglo society. Um, so at, at the highest end of that, you had people in the Anglo businesses, but also you had these locally owned banks, again, like the Bank of Ybor City. Uh, some of the pictures, are, unfortunately, are very good quality, but they're very important, so I include them. Uh, this one, again, uh, Gary Mormino will talk about this. Um, but a photograph like this of a factory in the United States, particularly in the United States South, in the late 19th and early 20th century, would have been unheard of. Because you have an integrated workforce, and a workforce of both men and women, all working in the same place. So if you did kind of look carefully in this picture and a few others afterward, you see white faces, black faces, uh, males and females, all in the same workplace. And again, that would have been, it was unheard of anywhere else in the South, or really anywhere in the country at the turn of the 20th century. Um, but it, it was kind of the way things were in Ybor City and in West Tampa. It's because, again, the workforce is largely Cuban. There are no Anglos. There are no African Americans in this picture. It's all a Latin workforce, predominantly Cuban, though again, some Spaniards and few Italians. And so that's what made this so unique. Outside of the, 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 the phrase is outside of New Orleans, it was the, the most multicultural place in the South, but I would argue that it's probably more so because you had more cultures here, more the larger variety of cultures here in Tampa than you even had in a place like New Orleans. Because you had um, native-born whites, native-born blacks, but you also had Cubans, Afro-Cubans, Spaniards, and Italians. And so you also had some Greeks kind of mixing too, uh, from Key West and moving up into Tarpon Springs. So, um, so there's a very, also there were some uh, East, um, Eastern European Jews and some Germans here as well. So you had a lot of people from a lot of different places all here, um, most because of the cigar industry and related supportive industries. Uh, this is an interior shot of one of those little um, Buckeye uh, cigar factories. You see the family all basically working. This is a larger, a little larger factory. Again, they all, had, the, the, the biggest factories all were almost identical. The layouts were the same, the orientations were the same, the layout among the floors were the same. There was a sub-basement, because we can't have basements in, in most of Florida, where the tobacco came in, then it went to the top floor, where the stemming happened, then down to the second floor, where the cigar rolling happened, then to the first floor, where it was packaged and shipped out. And that system worked really well, particularly from a worker standpoint, because it allowed flexibility. You didn't have to learn the layout of a whole new building if you got a new job. And so everything was the same. And it also worked out from a production standpoint. You didn't have workers have to waste time learning the layout of the new building because everything happened the same regardless of where the factory workers were. It didn't regardless of where, what building the factory workers worked in. Now this is, um, I believe, the Corrado Disca factory. It's a little bit later um, than our time period we're talking about. Uh, this is, again, along with the, the picture of Jose Marti, on the Ebor steps, this is kind of the other picture that's shown more than anyone else. I always feel bad for this guy, kind of co-mover guy here. <laughs> he's not happy about this picture being taken, clearly. Um, and so he's actually been cropped out of the Ebor City Museum uh, picture. But um, you know, gotta give him his, gotta show, him, show off his, his hairline. Um, but this picture is important. The other thing they crop out at the Ebor Museum is this. Elector. So, uh, Elector, James again mentioned his grandfather on his mom's side was uh, the last Elector in, uh, in Tampa. So you'll hear a lot about the Electors if you haven't heard already. But the Electors, Elector system, 
is really an amazing system that came from, uh, I think it came from Spain, but certainly was, was well used. It's only in Cuba. Okay, so uh, there's Spanish people, actually, who say that there were lectures in Spain. And so there, when I was in Spain a few years ago, they actually tried to claim that they had lectures. Um, right. And so, <laughs> but um, so brought here from Havana, along with Bolivia. Um, and, uh, and it was a wonderful system of education and just kind of passing the time. So you had the electors who would read the news, in the morning, say these novels, novellas, plays in the afternoon. They were auditioned by, um, the, the reading lists were created by, and they were paid by the workers. The factory owners didn't really like them that much. Um, and they were blamed for a lot of stuff that was going on. Some rightly, some wrongly. And so the um, but the the the, um, the lectura, the, the lector, lector system was incredibly important. Uh, and the lectors were played an incredibly important role in uh, the kind of social and political life of Ybor City in West Canada. Uh, they were seen as, as just these great leaders of thought um, and inspiration. Um, one lector, Victoriano Montega, Montega um, founded a newspaper, uh, La Gazzetta, which is still around today. Um, another uh, lector, a man named Francisco, Francisco Milian, was the mayor of West Tampa. And uh, he has a fun, not fun story, interesting story, tragic story. Um, in 1902, again, this is a sitting mayor of West Tampa, the seventh largest city in the state of Florida. Um, he was also a lector in the Bustillo Brothers factory in West Tampa. And uh, there was a lot of talk that he was, was being, saying a lot of radical stuff and really getting the workforce agitated about a strike. And so, uh, on the steps of City Hall in West Tampa, the police chief of Tampa, going back to the promise made to Ebor back in 1885, um, the police chief of the city of Tampa in 1902 approached Millian and said, uh, hey, we have uh, someone you need to, to identify um, who you know, says they know you, so can you hop in our carriage and come with us? And he said, sure, hopped in the carriage. And they took him out to a place called Six Mile Creek, stripped him, beat him, and, um, and said, you are leaving town. And they took him to Port Tampa, put him on a ship uh, for a one-way ticket to Honduras. And so, um, on the ship, uh, gets to Key West, somehow gets off the ship or gets a note uh, from where he is to the people of Key West to alert the people of Tampa that he's been kidnapped. And the people of Tampa, the, the workers of Tampa and West Tampa, immediately uh, go to the city leaders of both cities and say, look, if Francisco Milian's not returned, in you know, one or two days, there's going to be a general strike, and we're not going to work again until we see him here. And that was enough. And so, and again, this is, there's, there's more kind of Anglo politics at play here as well, because it was a city policeman, police chief, who, um, who arrested him, so to speak. Milian took him away. But it was a county sheriff who went to get him back and bring him back and escort him. And again, there was a lot of Anglo politics where they would use these two police forces against each other. So uh, there was a guy named uh, uh, D.B. McKay, Donald McKay, who was um, one, of, one of these, these uh, big labor busters. Um, but he also was married to the daughter of Gavina Gutierrez. And so he had a little bit of sentiment uh, towards the Latins when it was convenient for him. And so he either, I'm going to see if he, if he was in this kind of city administration or county administration at the time, but he was either involved in the kidnapping or the safe passage return of Francisco Millian. And he did arrive back safely, Millian did, a day or so later, I know for daughters, 12 days. He was kidnapped on the, so the 1st of November and came back on November 12th. Um, to a rousing um, reception at Port Tampa, taken on a train to Ybor City, uh, where he was greeted by 2,000 workers at the Labor Temple on 6th Avenue. And we kind of returned a hero. Um, unfortunately, Millian's story ends in tragedy. In 1909, he took his own life. Um, and for kind of unknown reasons, he had some personal problems. Just, you know, you can imagine somebody who takes their own life and they have. Uh, and allegedly, he comes one of the buildings in, in West Tampa. Uh, but, um, but his story is an interesting one. Again, because of the political power of these vigilante groups, uh, but also the power that the workers had at that time when they could bring him back. But for, for, the, for one city to kidnap another's mayor is pretty crazy. But that's what happened back then. Another shot of Electoral, probably the best picture of Electoral um, that I've ever seen. There may be others that, that are better. I'd like to see them if, if there are other pictures. 
You can see uh, this gentleman reading newspapers. Uh, there were, of course, Spanish language newspapers, both coming from Havana and also printed here in Tampa, that the lectors would read from. But allegedly, uh, the translation was so good of, of some of these individuals that they could read the Tampa Tribune, printed in English, and translate it on the fly as they read. Um, and so you had a very, in a workforce that was very knowledgeable of local events, world events, and very cultured because of the, the novels and novellas and things that were read in the afternoon. So you had a really great workforce. Now, that, the electoral system is often used um, by, by some to say that it had to be this way because the workforce was illiterate. That's not true. The workforce was, was literate and actually quite fluent, not just in Spanish, but here in Tampa, in Italian, and conversant in English as well, and, uh, and could, could read uh, at least one of those languages. And so the workforce was, was pretty well educated. And again, thinking about a factory up north, you're going to have someone read to you in a cotton mill or, or some other kind of steel mill? No, that's not going to happen. But uh, though we have a factory system, it's a craft factory of artisans using their hands to create cigars. The only thing they had, the only tool they had, was a chaveta and a little cutting board. So you would hear just the sound of cutting, and if the lectoris is something really great, you hear the tapping of the, the chaveta on the table. It's apparently caused quite a racket to hear 500 or so chavetas being tapped at the same time. Uh, again, children in the workforce um, performed all kinds of, of, of duties, both in the cigar industry, but also the associated industries. Uh, there was uh, two immense box factories here in Tampa, in Newport City in particular, that um, you, you know, once the, once the uh, cigars are created, you have to sell them in something. And so sometimes they were just sold in a, 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 a silk ribbon bundle, but more often than not, they didn't up in a box. And that box was made here in Tampa, but from uh, cedar trees that came from Cuba. And so um, you had a, 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 a sawmills that were here to process that wood, and you had the box factories to assemble that wood, and you had, again, oftentimes um, children working in the industry to, uh, to both create the cigars and the boxes. Uh, again, one of my favorite pictures, um, you see the picture in detail, that his hands, he's, you know, maybe 12 or 13, but his hand, he has the hands of like a 30-year-old. It's, it's really amazing how long he probably had been working. And again, it was important. Uh, if you needed, though it paid well, the cigar industry, you still needed all these different incomes to, um, to, to get by. Um, the industry was fairly fair of the time. Uh, whites and blacks, you know, African Cubans and, 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 and the other Latins, were paid the same. Men paid a little bit more than women, but not much more. Um, so again, for the time, pretty equitable and pretty fair. Children paid less because you could pay them less. Um, but, um, but, but you still had a, a workforce that was fairly well paid. Um, they would produce uh, you know, 100 cigars or so a day, uh, working five and a half days, six days a week. Uh, Christmas time, there's always a Christmas rush because there was a lot of cigars sold during Christmas time. Um, at its peak, Tampa had over 400 million cigars produced every year by hand. Um, I would like to, and I say this all the time, I never do it, but I'd like to someday find what the consumption of cigars is worldwide now. Um, because it not only shows production, uh, more, more kind of Cuban cigars, so to speak, Cuban tobacco, Cuban workers, were made in Tampa than in Cuba at one point. Um, but uh, it just shows also the consumption of cigars. You had incredible consumption of cigars in Europe and, and the United States, uh, which you just don't have today. And so that is one of the reasons why the industry began to fail uh, in the 1930s, 1940s. But, um, but at this time, consumption was at an all-time high. So you could have one city producing uh, half a billion cigars, almost, and, uh, and still not satiate that need worldwide. Another wonderful picture. Um, these girls are, are, are rolling cigars. You can see them at the table. You can barely see a little, um, a little bunch rack in front of them on the cigar workers' table. Um, again, part of an apprentice system that existed to, um, to teach people how to, to roll cigars and work in the cigar industry. It's a very important part of, of these families getting by and uh, making a living. Uh, this is a great shot uh, because you can see there's a little riser underneath these two chairs because they're so small. You have to actually boost the chairs up um, so they can actually work. These are working in, this, in the box factory. So 
Not only did you have the assembly of the boxes in the box factory, you also had the attachment of cigar labels. The cigar labels were a really important part of marketing both cigars and the city. The labels were not made here in Tampa, they were made in Germany and then later in New York. Um, the nicest labels were made through the process of lithography. And so they were really, really high end, very, very colorful uh, labels, again, on the higher end cigars. Um, and so you could really see the amount of money that was put into the marketing side. Um, and again, when you, go to, when you go through our galleries here, I think we're going to do that sometime uh, during your time here, as well as going to the Ewer City Museum if you get to go through there, you'll see examples of the cigar label art. Um, they, just like advertising today, they would use um, images of people that were popular at the time. A lot of women um, were using the, the imagery because most of the consumers were men. Uh, you see famous men uh, through history and famous men of, of the day, also featured in cigar uh, label art, as well as architecture and, and um, classic imagery as well. Uh, and so that all went to, to market the, uh, the cigars. Sometimes you'd even see imagery in Tampa as a way to market Tampa as well. I'm just the, the one that has the booster in there. So, uh, not only do you have an industry that is the main industry for Tampa, uh, the port is important, phosphate, I mentioned phosphate, uh, totally unrelated to cigars, of course, but phosphate is kind of the third of the big three that um, industries that start in the 1880s, the railroad, cigars, and phosphate. Phosphate's all around. Uh, Tampa is still one of the largest ports in the country because they do that stuff by tonnage, and phosphate's heavy. And so phosphate was a very important commodity that was being shipped out, and the port itself was a very important part of our economy, but the cigar industry was really the most important part of our economy. Um, again, you had uh, thousands and thousands of workers, but also these associated industries. But again, it's not just economic, it's cultural. And uh, the cultural side is what we um, see today still, because the industry itself, except for one cigar factory, um, is, is virtually gone. But you have the cultural remnants, uh, what you're going to have for lunch today, uh, you know, the, the, the cuisine that came through the Latin influences. But you also have these grand buildings, that uh, some of which you're going to see on your walking tour. Uh, the mutual aid societies that existed, that were founded by these immigrant communities. So again, you had Spaniards, you had Cubans, you had Italians, you also again had uh, some Germans and, and Eastern European Jewish people. Their influence is, is honestly a little overstated for Ybor City. Um, important, certainly, but, um, but there was a German-American club, which I don't have a picture here, um, and it's, I don't want to say it's accidental location is why people tie the Germans to um, Ybor City. It's on Nebraska Avenue, and Nebraska Avenue is the kind of traditional separation between white Tampa Heights and Latin Ybor City. It happens to be on the Latin side of Nebraska, but I think it's just that was the land that was available. Um, there certainly were German businessmen, but they didn't really live in Ybor, they lived in Tampa Heights. Um, and people like Robert Muggy, who predates um, Ybor City. Um, and again, you had a lot of, of non-Germans, but, but uh, European Jews, like the Moss Brothers, and I don't think the Moss Brothers were German, but others who were part of a Jewish community that was very important, but not so much a German community. But of the Latins, you had two Spanish clubs. You had this one, which was the Centro Espanol. Uh, and then you also had a club devoted exclusively to the Northern Spanish, the Asturians, the Centro Asturiana. And so the, the Centro Espanol was the oldest of them all, founded in, in I think, 1892, 1994. Um, and it was the, the kind of, sort of quote unquote wealthiest of all the clubs. Um, when this club building that you see in this picture, which is this building right here in the highlight, that was their second club building, the first club building in New York City burned down, as so many things did burn down. Um, but it opened in 1912. But the Centro Espanol was so financially sound, so healthy, and so big and influential that they actually opened two club buildings that same day. They opened this building in Ybor City, and they opened their kind of sister building in West Tampa on Howard Avenue. And that's the building still stands as well. So they could actually support two independent, so to speak, or two separate club buildings in the two uh, Latin sections of Tampa, I guess at that time it was West Tampa. But the Centro Espanol, their, their, their you know, mission was maintaining ties to Spain and the cultural connections to Spain, but also having a gathering place for those new immigrants who were coming, coming here. 
Uh, they also uh, did things to help foster transition into kind of American life, um, English classes and things like that, but they also kept great libraries and just really were cultural centers. Centro Soriano was founded, in a sense, out of the Centro Espanol because there was this, this idea of medical care being added to the list of things that were that were offered. And so Centro Soriano kind of broke away, because there was a Centro Soriano in Asturias, there was one in Havana, and they began offering medical care. And so they, the Asturiano uh, Spaniards, formed the Centro Soriano in Tampa as a branch of the Havana Centro Soriano, so they could offer medical care as well as the other benefits uh, that were offered, both social and practical. So after that happened, Centro Espanol also began offering uh, medical benefits. Both Centro Asturiano and Centro Espanol opened hospitals. Centro Asturiano's hospital building still stands, it's in Tampa Heights. The one that Centro Espanol uh, operated was on the Bay Shore, which is a really kind of nice uh, road in Tampa that goes along the bay. It was uh, torn down in the 1960s, um, but both offered medical care as part of their, uh, their dues. It was basically an HMO. Um, the, uh, the white medical establishment hated the idea of these mutual aid societies offering what they called socialized medicine. And they um, kicked out any doctors from the Hillsborough Medical Association who would practice medicine in either or for either the Centro Asturiano, Centro Espanol, or later the uh, Cuban Club and the Italian Club. Um, because they were that adamant that you, know, you can't have somebody else set your, your rates. You set your own rates, as long as we agree to it, of course. But, um, but you can't have socialized medicine. And that's in a sense what it was, kind of, again, the, the idea of the HMO. Um, they offered what they called, what was come to be called cradle to grave um, service. They were there when you were born, and they even had their own cemeteries or sections of cemeteries, so they were there when you died. So you had benefits from the moment you were born until the moment you died. And as long as Ybor City and West Tampa were successful, these places were very, very successful. So you had multiple generations of people in these um, mutual aid societies. So again, you have the Centro Espanol, the Centro Asturiano, and these are all their second or third buildings because the first building's all burned down. So this is the Centro Asturiano. Not gonna be part of your tour either in Ybor City because it's a little further to the north um, than you're gonna be going, but it's still there. The Italian Club, which is on 7th Avenue, um, also, again, the idea of the mutual aid society for the Italians. There's a Sicilian club. Most of the Italians in Tampa, almost all of them, came not from Italy, but from Sicily, and from three little villages, in Sicily to be specific. Um, the story of the Italians, again, you'll hear this with Gary a little bit, because they, they come a little bit later, but some did arrive in the 1890s. Um, you had Sicilians coming into America just to get away from Sicily and the, the hardships that they had there, and often, if they didn't go north, they, when they came to the south, they went to New Orleans uh, to work in the, the sugar cane industry. And they also built their way into Florida because there was a sugar cane industry here, and well, sugar industry here as well, in the Everglades, um, or even kind of northern uh, central Florida and Kissimmee area. But sugar cane work, if you don't know, which you probably do, is awful, awful, awful work. It's the, probably one of the worst things you can do for a living. And so, particularly the, the Italians that made it to Florida, heard about this little Latin enclave called Ebor City, and they thought, well, we can work there, and though we don't speak Spanish, we can at least maybe be around people who we have a little more of a connection to, and we can do something uh, that would be an associated industry. So many uh, um, Italians early on had farms or so, you know, kind of produce food related things, um, but then you saw them kind of getting into all, all um, uh, portions of Ebor City society. And so again, to the point where they had their own club building as well. They still do. The uh, Centro Asturiano, the Italian club, and the Cuban club all operate their buildings. I'm going to show you in these pictures. Centro Espanol still exists, but they don't operate either one of their club buildings. And I'll show you the last um, group. This uh, Martín Maceo, I'll tell you, talk about this specifically. Uh, this is the Cuban club. Uh, you going to go by the Cuban club, Frank? That's where we start. Oh, well, there you go. So you're going to start there. Um, there's a... Um, a bus of uh, Jose Marti, who is uh, right here in this portion uh, of the property, which is not pictured here in this, this shot. There's also a bus of Marti inside. So the Lisu Cubano and the other Cuban revolutionary organizations that got their start in the 1880s and 1890s in Tampa were integrated. After the, the end of the Cuban Revolution, the Spanish-American War in 1898, when you have a 
quote unquote free Cuba. There's no need to have these patriotic revolutionary clubs anymore. And so the uh, Circulo Cubano reforms in 1899, but without the Afro Cuban members. And so um, it's, you know, it's been said that they did this because of the Jim Crow laws. There, I'm sure, is some truth to that, but there's also some truth to their desire to do so anyway, and they could use the Southern laws as a cover for that. Um, regardless of the reason or reasons, that's what happened. So in 1899, you had the Circle of Cubano, uh, which is the Cuban club, uh, created for white Cubans, kicking out all of the Afro-Cubans. So the Afro-Cubans start their own club, and it's called uh, the Union de Marti Maceo, so after, named after Jose Marti, and Antonio Maceo, uh, the, the great uh, Afro-Cuban general who um, was so important in the 1895 revolution. And so they, uh, and, and, and interestingly, and to their credit, to their kind of almost to their point, to the uh, Cuba club, they didn't just call it the, the Maceo club, they called it the Marti Maceo club. Kind of continuing the ideal that Marti had of the union, literally the union of white and black Cubans together. Even though there were no white Cubans in that club, but they're telling their, literally their cousins, that um, even though you kick us out of your white club, we are still holding the ideals of both Marti and Maceo High in our club building. So of all the clubs that I just showed you, including Marti and Maceo, and German American, which I didn't show you, only one of these mutual aid societies lost their buildings during the Urban War. And it's this one. And no surprise, is the, the Afro-Cuban, the black club, is the one that falls victim to urban renewal. Uh, they moved into a warehouse, and I think they just moved out of the warehouse um, recently. So I'm not sure where my team is saying was on. They, they exist as a club. Anybody know? I'm sorry. They're, they're just west of uh, Marty French Park. Oh. On 7th Avenue. They're still on 7th? They're still on 7th. But, they, but they're, they're still in their little building? I thought they had to move out of that building. Oh, okay. I thought they lost the building. So they kept the building. Oh, they must have they didn't. Okay, so good. That's an update for me. They didn't lose the building. I thought they were going to lose the building that they had to move into after they lost the, the, this building. So that's good. So yeah, it's a very, very small club. Uh, but I'm glad that at least they were able to keep the building. Because that would have been two that they lost, which, again, pretty tragic. Um, a little bit of legacy now. Um, some things that you're going to see or you'll hear about as you are here um, for the rest of of your time. This is the, the, a photograph from the 50s of the home of Paulina and Roberto Pedroso. Uh, the Pedrosos left Tampa after the uh, revolution was, was, was fought and won. They went back to Cuba and lived their lives there. This building uh, changed hands as buildings do over the course of time. And in the 1950s, the Cuban government bought this building. And uh, they had the idea with the, um, the help of the Ybor City Rotary of opening up a museum to Marti and to the Cuban Revolution and to the connection between Tampa and Cuba. Um, but then another revolution happened. And so, um, so but, but the building never changed hands. And so the government of Cuba still owns this property. Now the building caught fire and uh, was badly damaged and so it was torn down. Uh, but a park was put up in its place. Uh, Friends of Marti Park, Park uh, de Jose, Jose Marti. So this stands now where the Pedroso home was, and you'll be able to go by this, right, Frank? Yes, sir. And so this park, though, is very politicized, as you can imagine, and is, um, is kind of part of the tug of war that exists between uh, pro and anti-Castro Cubans. Now, during the beginning parts of the revolution, we'll get too much of this because you'll hear this later, um, the, people, the, the old Cubans of Tampa uh, really didn't have a problem too much with, with, um, with Castro. Castro actually came here um, to raise money for the effort. Um, this, of course, before the, 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 the um, revolution became a solely a communist um, revolution. Um, and so there was a, this, 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 this park was seen as, it still is seen as this divide between the old Cubans who were more radical in general and modern Cuban immigrants who, who are certainly less so. Uh, and so you'll see, I you don't think you see it play out necessarily while you're here, although there's always a chance uh, that the gate will be locked, even if it's supposed to be open, or some other shenanigans will be happening related to Marty Park. So, again, just to show you uh, another schematic uh, of a growing Tampa because of the cigar industry. This is 1912 before 
uh, to after the port is established here, uh, again, in proximity to Ybor City. All of this land was very marshy at the founding of Ybor City, uh, but by 1915, they actually created a shipping channel called Ybor Channel to, um, to help integrate Ybor City with the larger port system. You also have uh, West Tampa having grown quite a bit and still is a separate city uh, when this map was created. And then lastly, one of my favorite cigar labels, the USA Cuba label. Uh, because it, and again, it's an outsized symbol of, of the connection between Tampa and Cuba. Um, but you see a, a, a Tampa that dominates Florida, which is certainly how I see Tampa in Florida. Um, and you see Havana as it's situated in Cuba. And it really, again, uh, thinking about the symbolism that is, that is inherent in any marketing piece and any, any advertising piece, um, but also in propaganda, um, you see the symbolism that is, is being played out here. So the combination of USA and Cuba as almost one thing, but also the importance of both Tampa and Havana uh, in that relationship. And so you have two countries as the name of the label, but you really just see two cities. You see Tampa and you see Havana. And that's the, 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 the symbolism that is, is, is been so apparent in this label. Um, but it's a symbolism that is, is rooted in history, you know, going back to easily the late 1700s, if not earlier, um, and going to this day. Um, with the relaxation of, of the embargo that happened under uh, President Obama, there uh, were flights, uh, commercial flights out of Tampa, uh, cruise ships coming out of Tampa going to Cuba. Now that certainly has been put into doubt again. Uh, but uh, there's, there's no doubt that as relations go back and forth, uh, there will always be a relationship between Tampa and Havana. So with that, I thank you all so much for your attention and time. Does anybody have any uh, questions about any of this? Or anything else you think of? You, know, you saw your riverboat trip all the way here? But, uh, Kermit, I, 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 I assume it's true because my mother always told me this. But, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything your mother says. <laughs> <laughs> but of all the mutual aid societies, she always said that the, the only one that was integrated was the Union Marti Maceo. Absolutely. She yes. was young and they would go dancing. Uh, they would always go to the Union Marti Maceo. It was, uh, it's interesting, but the other ones became segregated. It was an but, official policy to be open to whites and blacks. Yeah, she said that was she always did. the best club anyway, the best, right. the best, the best, the best, the best dances. Yeah. yeah, and so, and there's, in an early Nibor's history, there was a, a, a definite, you know, uh, insularness to the different clubs. But after the first generation, you know, had kind of gone by, and the second, third generations were in, you saw a lot more mingling, and so you would see almost kind of progressive parties between the Italian club, the, the Centro Spagnolo, Martin Maceo, um, as just as any you know second, third generation uh, group kind of sees it, because they're in schools with each other. Although again, uh, because exactly then, because you have segregation, you don't see schools integrated at all. Um, but uh, you see the Spaniards, Italians, and Cubans in schools together, white Cubans together. Um, in the schools of Ybor City and West Tampa. But again, you see segregation uh, separating Afro-Cubans. And again, there's a wonderful book uh, by Susan Greenbaum, who's a, a retired anthropologist from USF. She's talking about um, Oh, wonderful. So you hear all about Afro-Cubans. But uh, you will learn that they, uh, not only after the revolution were isolated by white Cubans, they also were never accepted into the African-American community. And nor did they want that acceptance. Uh, they saw themselves as above African-Americans because they were bilingual, they were educated, and they weren't you know, these African Americans, they didn't call them that, of course, um, but um, exactly. And so they saw themselves as socially higher. And you always want to find someone below you socially because you, it makes you, you know, better, uh, feel better at least. And so, but they, but that exclusion was, was mutual because the African Americans didn't understand Spanish. Who are these newcomers coming into our place? And so they, 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 they lived in a very unique place. And so Susan will tell you all about that. So it's early. Exactly. So yeah, before, before the public school system comes in to take over these schools and Sesame School were burned with Sesame Hall. But yeah, the VME board school was still stands. Uh, but it was run by by a Latin contingent. You, know, you see that relaxation of race relations. 
Where do African Americans live in Canada? Oh, that's such a great question. I totally forgot to point that out. Thank you for asking. Oh, here it is. Well, I'll show you some. Yeah, the place called the Scrum. And that's the, the, the biggest African American neighborhood was, was the Scrum. There were other uh, neighborhoods all around uh, Tampa. But I can show you in, in this map, actually. So, so this is kind of white Tampa right here. Tampa Heights, downtown Tampa, and Hyde Park. And this is Cuban West Tampa, a separate city. And this is Cuban, Spanish, Italian, and Ebor City. Uh, the Scrub, which was the traditional, really the first uh, black neighborhood, black community, is right in this space between Tampa and Ebor. And it existed in its very, very earliest forms when Ebor uh, purchased this land from, from Leslie. And so the, the African American population kind of first started out at, um, at the end of the Civil War, basically leaving Tampa, the village of Tampa and going to the fringes, both to the north and to the east. As downtown Tampa began to really kind of began and then began to grow, the African Americans who were here began joining those who were here in what was called the scrub. Called the scrub because literally it was in the scrub of meadow um, kind of landscape. Um, also that the, the kind of bad term of scrub, kind of a, a, a uh, elected place, was applied to it. But literally, archaeologists, or anthropologists, and archaeologists have found the roots of these scrub palmettos in, and actually it's called that too on an old map, different old map, um, in that area. So it's, it's both kind of botanically scrubby and also applied that by the white citizens of Tampa. Uh, it became, and it coalesced around the street called, uh, originally called Center Avenue, but then it changed to Central Avenue, it became the black business district for Tampa. And so, but one of the things that Tampa had going against it from a preservation standpoint and from a focal point-ish kind of thing is we had four downtowns. We had White downtown Tampa with Franklin Street as the main drug, kind of main, main thoroughfare. Uh, the Latin downtown of 7th Avenue. The West Tampa downtown of, on, along Howard and Main. And then the Black downtown of Central Avenue. So you had the separation of, of people and businesses that you didn't have in other places. So again, from a kind of preservation standpoint, all these different places to try and either preserve or cover over. And so in the case of Central, it's covered over by the interstate. Interstate 275 and I-4, the interchange, is literally on top of Central Avenue. Um, uh, integration played a role in that, uh, but uh, so did urban planning. That, of course, is done by, by the white leadership of Tampa. Um, and, uh, but you also, so you, then you have the, um, the, the, the kind of um, uh, promotion of Ebor City as this important um, tourist attraction, and so 7th Avenue becomes a focal point of that. So, and also, again, with the interstate, you have the, the separation of, of, e, of Ebor City. The northern part of Ebor, which is just as important historically, uh, is neglected, for lack of a better term, after the interstate comes through. So the north half is just locked off. And it's, again, culturally very important, but it's not seen as such. And even when it comes time for historic districts to be created, the interstate's a northern boundary. And so now it's just taking time for that to, to, to get attention of, of kind of economic redevelopment. Uh, same with West Tampa, it's bifurcated by the interstate as well. The north half of West Tampa is what uh, survives for the most part. So, yes? Given how well the timing of the Key West fire worked out for Martinez Ebor's plan to control his workforce in Ebor City, did anybody ever speculate about arson? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't. I think it was a larger fire than just his factory, um, and so there are fires just all the time. And so again, in a place like Key West, with a, uh, a shaky, for lack of a better term, infrastructure and lack of, of Lots of fresh water. Fires are a really, really big problem. Um, I'm sure Ebor did not want. I, I, I would doubt Ebor wanted the factory to burn down because at the very least he could just sold some I think, made some money off of that. So I don't think arson was a, a factor. And I don't think it's anybody in Tampa going out and burning factory down either because that would could be a problem if they found out that was a problem. Yes. Yeah, I'd just like to mention that uh, actually West Tampa has the largest number of factories that are still standing. About eight to ten? Yeah. Eleven? 
So uh, it is really worth seeing those. Absolutely. And I'd also like to mention that Cubans not only split along racial lines in the Cuban clubs, but then they split again along political lines because there is another Cuban club, Club Civico Cubano, yeah. after the uh, after the '59 revolution. Mm -hmm. Although they attempted to integrate with the Ciclo Cubano in Ybor City, uh, the politics, because these were radical cigar maker Cubans, uh, sympathetic to the Cuban Revolution of 59. Uh, so there's a split. Exactly. Thank you. Um, I can the, the story of the strippers, I can verify the census record. Oh, so yeah. I, uh, my wife's Yes, it's true. So in the census, they asked her what she did in the occupation, and they initially wrote stripper, mm -hmm. and someone later went in and scratched them all out. It's the whole page. Scratched wow. them out, and when they saw it, it was a scar. Uh -huh. I have the sense of my grandmother. It should be with Tampa, have your invitation for her. You have a kind of stripper. It's a funny coincidence. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, Glenn Westfall was a, he moved to New Mexico, but he was a, uh, 
professor at HCC here in Tampa. He did a dissertation on um, on history on VME, and so he did an incredible amount of research uh, on the cigar industry in Tampa. He's written a few books. Great. And Marti City. Oh, exactly, Ocala's. Oh, <laughs> Marti City. Yeah. So, anything else? Yes, one more. Uh, Thank you, this is great. I was wondering if, if, uh, where, all, where these images came from. There were places. Um, the images that I used came from a variety of sources. The History Center, of course, we have a, a collection of thousands of photographs. Uh, the Public Library, uh, USF, both the uh, Piso collection at USF and other collections. Um, it's an immense amount of, of, of source material. Uh, yeah, this in particular is Sanborn Fire Insurance Map. Um, I got this particular image from the University of Florida, the PKN Library, where they have uh, the color uh, maps digitized. So we have our own Sanborns, but they're all later, they have all the pastovers over them. Um, so there's just sources everywhere. The, um, for those of you who don't know, the uh, Lewis Hine photographs are at the Library of Congress, uh, an incredible collection. Um, and so uh, there's, there's collections kind of everywhere. Yeah, just uh, again on uh, on Thursday, we're all taking a group uh, trip to the special collections at USF. They're going to give us a presentation on all these collections, and you all will have privileges there as well to to, to do research there at the special collections if you like. Yeah, and, and as well, man, and um, you guys have privileges here. Oh yeah, the whole month. I want to return to yeah. the Tampa Bay. I think it's just Yeah. Great. So what you uh, <laughs> what you all do? You all have these thing tags. Uh, when you come. You see, walk out of here, you'll see the, our, our little visitor services desk uh, to the right. Uh, you just present this to visitor services, and this is your ticket into the History Center during your entire time in Tampa. And so uh, if you find time in the weekend or whatever it is, as long as it's between 10 o'clock in the morning and 5 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, you are welcome as our guests to come here. Uh, we also have a, um, kind of a limited number of people of engagement. On Wednesday, Wednesday evening at six o'clock, if you have time and you're not too tired, and you can sign up and get a space, uh, there is a brewery in Tampa. There's about 75 in the Tampa area um, now, but there's one called Cigar City Brewery Company, um, and they are doing a presentation here. Uh, they have a position. This is how entrenched they are in Tampa history. They have a position on their staff uh, called El Lector, a man named Neil Calais. And he is uh, you know, part marketing, but also just part you know, beer savant. And he's going to talk about uh, the, found, the founding and operations of Cigar City uh, Brewing and a few of their beers, a High Lie, which is the IPA, um, and I think Florida Cracker, not doing Maduro, unfortunately. Um, they're going to do Hanaku, which is their limited release beer. Um, but yeah, they, they've got. Um, they've got uh, if you all saw our Facebook page, we posted a, a picture of the of us, and it's a beautiful bottle, it's a beautiful label. Yeah. Yeah. In the in the interest of full Tampa disclosure, the founder of, of, of Cigar City Brewing is a man named Joey Redner. Uh, his father, Joe Redner, uh, had a lot to do with stripping, but nothing to do with cigars. <laughs> and so, <laughs> oh, yeah. strip clubs at Tampa. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and that's one of the story of Tampa history. But, um, but Joey has, uh, it, his dad invested a bit in, in the, the cigar city brewing, but Joey made an incredible business out of it. Um, and so, it is probably the most popular brewery, uh, micro or craft brewery in Tampa, and one of the most popular in the, in the country. I just wanted to address the question because um, if anyone was interested in the breakdown of male to female employees or by ethnicity, it's on page one and nine in the number of open doors. Perfect. Okay. Oh, so there, so Gary and. Um, in what years? In George, because that is what? What years? Oh, uh, 1910. Okay. So there you go. Yeah, of course. Yes. I just want to ask you about the, the term in your title, Cracker. Um, so I, I was understood that to be a derogatory term for Anglo, but you you, yeah. you, you, you tied it more to the Confederacy. So is that? It's it, the crackers. It's kind of a self-identifying term of native born Floridians and some Georgians. It is seen as derisive, uh, but not by those who call themselves crackers. <laughs> um, and so it's it can be kind of a, almost a term of endearment or a self-identification as a southerner. Um, I don't, nowadays in kind of modern times, 
there, there could be seen a connotation or connection with the Confederacy. Um, but more kind of by coincidence than by any sort of political field, certainly at the time that was one title, that uh, Tony wrote written, written his book in the, I think that book came out in the 70s. It was just what you called everybody who wasn't, who, everybody who was from here, Floridians and, 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 and Georgians, and some identified as crackers. Um, again, now there's a lot of baggage that can come with that term um, as a Southern white, basically. Yes? Until I was a grown man, I thought "craca" was a Spanish word. Yeah. 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 I said, no, I said "craca." I thought "craca" was a Spanish word. Yeah. 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 But, you know, and the uh, and, uh, um, city bird has a beer called Yeah, Florida Crowder, exactly. Cracker Town. Cracker Town. Cracker Country. <laughs> they go to uh, uh, on field trips. Yeah, at the state fairgrounds here in Tampa, there is a little village of 19th century uh, pioneer homes, uh, white pioneer homes, um, that's an assemblage called Cracker Country. Again, in the, until, I don't know, modern times, I don't know if someone's addressed this lately, maybe they will. Um, cracker isn't seen as a bad word. It's just, it's just a. Well, of course, it was like, like the N word, I guess. In some ways. I tell my students it's a word you better be smiling when you say. It. Oh, yeah. 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 Good point. So, yes. uh, I have another question about the um, the Buckeye. Uh, yes. Kind of cottage industry was that was that kind of like piecework or was that it was? Well, no, it was it was they the, they sell boat. And they sell, they like sold them. Yeah, yeah. Sold them. Yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. Uh, that little building had its own factory name and factory number. It's a, you know, for all outside viewing, it would be a house. But it was a cigar factory. Again, paying their taxes, selling their products, labels, the whole thing, boxing, the whole deal. And again, there was far more Buckeyes than there were in the big buildings. And the rollers, you know, the rollers got a monthly allowance of tobacco. Of fumas. Yeah, and they could take them home. And my grandfather, my grandparents would always roll cigars at home too and give them to friends or even sell some of them. Or exactly. Whatever. So it was an allotment. Yeah. There was a strike here in Tampa, because a big strike, mm -hmm. because the factories tried to eliminate the, the allowance of fumas. They tried to eliminate it. It's called a, a, La Huelga de la Peseta. Sí. And, and, yeah, and it was a big one. Yeah. yeah. There were lots of strikes, you know, you, yeah. despite the promises by this, the kind of white leadership, the Anglo leadership. There were lots of strikes that, that occurred. Um, some like that. Others about uh, about uh, the, the foremans and the and the the, uh, the amount of influence a foreman could have on the workers. Uh, there was a weight strike. There was um, there was a strike over the uh, cages and the rings to make sure you're making the cigars the same size. Very insulting to crafts men and crafts women who are saying, you're not making cigars the right way, you're not making them the same, same weight all the time, and the same diameter the whole time, the same length the whole time. And so there were these fights back and forth. Again, the, the electors were their own kind of lightning rod of strikes. Um, you can hear about the end of the electoral system, uh, but, uh, but it came at a time when labor was greatly weakened by mechanization and by the, the decline of, 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 of cigar smoking in general. But again, you can hear about that in the coming weeks. There was a woman like tour from Puerto Rico. Oh, yeah. 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 She was Puerto Rico. She was like down here. Yeah. 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 But I just, I just wanted to add that. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you for for writing. Absolutely. Yeah. What was your name? Luisa Cabetillo. Luisa Cabetillo. Luisa Cabetillo. She was a radical feminist. Yes, she was radical. She didn't wear pants. She wore pants. Yeah. She got arrested in Havana for wearing pants. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? No, thank you all very much, and again,